The Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day. Jacob, welcome to the first podcast. This is perhaps the Monday of the year in which um, people finally shake off memories of Christmas and the new year and knuckle down to work in usual order. So I thought I'd start by asking you a very general question uh, as MPs gather this week about what you think the political year holds, what the main features in the landscape are going to be, what the main opportunities and dangers for the government are. Political forecasting has become a very dangerous habit uh, because very few people last year thought that there would be a general election and the um, surge in Corbyn mania that took place last year. So with the caveats of uncertainty and the ability to get this hopelessly wrong, this year is likely to continue to be a major Brexit year, that it is the biggest constitutional change this country has faced in several generations and inevitably will take up an enormous amount of government time and energy and it will be important to ensure that it's being done correctly and in a way that will work. Uh, But the pitfalls often come in areas that you don't expect, that they don't come neatly in the areas that you've been focusing on, they come out of the blue from areas that were thought to be under control. So that's what the government always has to be alert for. If you think of last year, one of the biggest pitfalls was the Grenfell Towers disaster. And that really brought housing to the forefront of people's minds in a way it hadn't been for a long time. And I think the government will therefore, on the domestic agenda beyond Brexit, need to be working out solutions for housing that command public confidence and that begin to show things are happening. And the other obvious area uh, is the health service, which is clearly under strain during the winter flu outbreak. But in reality, austerity in the NHS for seven years of 1% real increases is against what has happened in its previous history and is going to be very hard to continue with however much uh, there are limited resources. Let's just follow the conversation through on those two domestic policy areas you you mentioned. Uh, The government has no majority of its own, it's supported by the DUP. Um, It's not in the position to pass major legislation. The social care plan in the manifesto is, I presume, dead as far as legislation is is concerned. What can the government actually do as we move forward towards 2022 to actually grapple with this problem of unjoined up services, hugely rising costs, pressure on the NHS day to day when its room in the Commons is so limited? There are some things in legislation that are already there that aren't used. So, for example, um, councils could be charged for uh, late releases of patients, that there is a facility to charge a council a per-night amount by hospitals if a patient who's ready to leave doesn't have the social care package in place. And the NHS hasn't done that because it thought it would be a rather aggressive approach towards councils, but that if the money is being um, excessively spent on high cost keep moving in hospital overnight and there's a lower cost solution with um, the councils, you may want to put a little bit of pressure on them. I think um, the issue you mentioned of joining up budgets is one as much psychological as legislative that within the public service and possibly outside as well, there is a tendency for people to be very proprietorial about their budget rather than to view it as the whole government expenditure of taxpayers' money. And therefore, if there are lower cost solutions but they come from a different budget, then the government needs to be able to integrate things to make sure that the budget that has the money pays for the end uh, solution. So I think there are things that can be done. I think on housing, Much of what can be done in housing uh, is by regulation and by ministerial direction, not by further legislation. If you take uh, planning decisions, planning decisions on appeal to the government are determined by, by and large, um, 
policies enunciated by the department, not things that are in legislation. It's not exclusively true, and there are some aspects of legislative that would be hard to change, but you could increase the rate at which planning permissions are given very significantly by ministerial action. Can you do this without um, making substantial alterations to green belt or green land? I think you need to differentiate between green belt and green land, that the ability to build on green fields that aren't designated green belt is pretty widespread, is much less protected than green belt. With the green belt, if councils come forward with proposals to remove land from the green belt, that's relatively straightforward, but it's very hard for the government to mandate that green belt land should be removed, and indeed the government has said it doesn't want to do that. Um, councils, just, I just to just to interrupt for a moment, um, if the government says, this has clearly been an intention of Sajid Jafid, um, we want proper numbers from you for house building, uh, not some of the numbers that you give, but numbers that are accurate. If you then give them the numbers and they have no alternative, they will have to start finding some land on Green Belt if there's no other option available to them. Well, it will be their local choice. They will say, we would like to take this bit of land out of the green belt rather than build on this green field. And I think that's a reasonable choice to encourage councils to make. And not all green belt land is high quality, beautiful, rolling countryside. Some of it's pretty ugly scrub land that has been in the green belt for a long time and nobody's really reconsidered it. And I think for councils to look at their green belt and say, is this serving the purpose of the green belt, is something it's reasonable for the government to put a bit of pressure on to make sure that it happens. Just be absolutely clear for the listeners. Um, you're very much not a NIMBY, are you not? You're very much someone who's consistently made the case for higher levels of house building if we're to get home ownership back on the road. I think it's very important home ownership, and I recognise that even in my own constituency in North East Somerset, which is 70% green belt, we are going to face these difficult choices. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've noticed, speaking to conservative associations around the country, that the mood in the country has changed if in 2010 you said to a Conservative Association we should build on a green field, let alone the green belt, it was quite shocking. Um, now, if you say, look, we've got to think about green fields, people are saying to me, well, what about the green belt? We can't just exclude everything that's historically been in the green belt. So I have to think the voters uh, and our members are ahead of the politicians in recognising that to allow people to have houses that they want to live in, that they like, uh, and that they can then buy, we are going to have to build more. And just again on social care and fining councils, I presume the government's reluctant to do that because the largest party in local government still, after years in office, is the Conservatives, and ministers are presumably reluctant to start slapping fines on Conservative councils? Um, I'm sure there's some political consideration within it. I think it's the NHS that can decide to do it quasi-independently rather than it being a, a governmental decision. And it's not really a fine. It's saying that there is this cost. If the person were not in hospital anymore, you would have this cost. But because the person hasn't had the arrangements made to leave hospital, you're avoiding this cost. So we're simply going to say, whether the person is in hospital or outside, the cost will still fall on you if the person is ready to be uh, released. Why do you think the NHS hasn't acted um, in this way? I, I think there are some things in law that don't get used and then going back to them appears to be more politi pro politically problematic than in reality it is. Now, talking of political problems, how big a challenge is handling the EU withdrawal bill with respect for the decision that the voters reached in the referendum for the House of Lords. Um, the bill's going up to the Lords. The Lords is packed full of people who are not exactly fans of Brexit. The coalition agreement, rightly or wrongly, wanted a House of Lords that uh, represented or, or was more faithful to votes cast in the latest general election. If that principle applied, the Liberal Democrats would be grossly overrepresented in the, in the Lords. Um, it doesn't really seem that 
Um, many of their peers feel particularly constrained by what the voters decided to do in the EU referendum. You know, how difficult a moment do you think this is for the Lords? And do you think they will basically acknowledge the right that the Commons has, the government has, to get this bill through? And to what extent do you think the Lords will dig their heels in? Mm. Uh, there are reminiscences in relation to Lords in 1909 that instead of having uh, belted earls baiting down an increase in taxation that would hit them, you've got um, retired bureaucrats desperately trying to ensure that their beloved project is maintained. And you are at risk from the Lords' point of view of getting into a peers versus the people challenge. Peers versus the people is always won by the people. And the Lords need to remember that, and they need to recognise that they do not have democratic legitimacy. They are there as a revising chamber, but our constitutional settlement accepts that the basic principal power is with the House of Commons on behalf of the people, and that a referendum is even more powerful and authoritative than that. And so if the Lords, in their wisdom, and a lot of them are very pro-European, decide to try to frustrate the democratic will of the people, both as expressed by the House of Commons and by a referendum, then the Lords will, as an institution, get into difficulties. The devil's advocate question would be, the Lords are quite entitled to amend legislation. That's what a revising chamber is for. The sticking point that's presumably in your mind is if they refuse to accept the government then sending, or the Commons rather, sending their amendments back if the Commons decides to reject them. In other words, your concern would be that there's sort of endless ping-pong and the Lord's really seeking to hold this bill up. It depends what you mean by amend, that there are amendments and amendments. There are some amendments that correct errors that have been made in the drafting of a bill. There are things that emerge during the debate in the bill where the wording is not ideal or where it becomes clear that a different approach would be better. There are then amendments that are basically pushed through to frustrate the purpose of a bill. The Lords makes technical amendments that improve the drafting of the bill. That's what they're there for. If, on the other hand, the Lords push through amendments that try to prevent Brexit, uh, try to frustrate it in principle, that is when they will be in difficulties. Such as an amendment that sought a second referendum, for example. I think people would view. Well, I think second referendum would be very dangerous territory for the Lords because it would be seen as the characteristic European hatred of democracy. So if you vote the wrong way, you get made to vote again until you vote the right way, and it would be seen as a blocking amendment. But I also then think Leave would win, at which point the House of Lords would look stunningly ridiculous. Uh, and there would be very great pressure for a fundamental reform. I mean, just to clear this up once and for all, um, people are polled in relation to how they would vote if there was an EU referendum today. It's an interesting question, but it's perhaps not as pertinent as the question of whether you want a second referendum at all. And if you go beneath the headlines about Andrew Adonis or Nigel Farage or whatever, you'd find very small numbers of people want a second referendum and that the general reaction of the public is Brenda from Bristol, isn't it? Oh, no, not again. I, I think that's right, and I think it's worth looking at Nicola Sturgeon's result in Scotland in the general election when calling for a second referendum, that not only did people not want a second referendum, but it reduced the vote of the person advocating it. I happen to think that if you had a second referendum, the debate on Brexit would be much less about the details of Brexit and much more about why are we being made to vote twice when we've already made the decision. And therefore I think you would find the reaction anti the referendum itself made the previous vote even stronger. There was an element of that with the AV referendum, was there not? There was indeed, I think people That's didn't. in fact probably what decided it, what in, in the margin by which it was decided. Just looking back for a moment to um, last week's reshuffle. There's a critique emerging, um, which you know, we get at the foot of Con Home all the time, that the whole thing was a vast study in political correctness. What do you think about that? Um, I don't think that's particularly fair, actually. I, I think many able people within the Conservative Party were promoted, and people who deserve the promotions uh, that they have received.
I think the Prime Minister had to act within the majority that she's got and the authority that she has from that majority, that it wasn't possible for her to cast the ministry entirely in her own image, and that that has, to some extent, reinforced cabinet government, which is a good thing, I think, constitutionally. It is better to have cabinet government than an overmighty uh, prime minister. Um, so, no, I don't think it's purely about political correctness. You don't have any sympathy at all for the view that we shouldn't really be casting shuffles on the basis of making the government look more like Britain as the most important factor, but that we should simply be trying to appoint the best people for the job. Of course we should be appointing the best people for the job. I think this idea of um, making it look like Britain is nonsense. I don't have any time for that. But I think all the people who appointed were people of the highest ability. Therefore, the shuffle wasn't a study in political correctness because it didn't do the lamentable thing about which our readers are complaining. That's right. It appointed able people to senior roles, and that is a that is a good thing. Where do you think we're going on Carillion? And there'll presumably be a statement or an urgent question today. Well, I don't think the government should bail out bankrupt companies. I think it's a bad principle. And if Carillion's gone bust, Carillion's gone bust, and the market will sort it out. And the contracts will um, be reassigned if they're profitable. Contract. Do you sense there's much political pressure for a bailout? I see Vince Cable said there shouldn't be one. Well, it's I'm with Vince Cable straw, on this. Straw, <laughs> interesting straw in the wind. Yeah, I, I, I think um, contractors of this kind are very different from the banks. You have to bail out the banks because you've got to save depositors. You cannot ruin all the small savers in the country overnight. With Carillion, that's simply not the case. And most of the jobs with Carillion will remain because the contracts are still there. The building projects still need to go ahead. The school meals still need to be produced. Uh, so there will be some worrying uncertainty for people employed by Carillion or by Carillion's contractors. Uh, but the work will carry on in a different form with a different company and with new contracts rather than all this work stopping completely. There is a critique that some ministers were still doling out contracts when it was evident Carillion was in deep trouble the time to today's name, Chris Grayling, and called on him to go in its leader columns. Do you have any reservations about the degree to which money was given to Carillion in relation to the information that was available about uh, it? I understand the HS2 contract, which is the most important one, uh, is with a consortium of which Carillion is a part that is able to continue, uh, it's got three partners with only two of the three partners remaining. I think contracts were more carefully written than perhaps credit is being given for uh, and much so I think HSC is a complete waste of money. Um, it's not the money being wasted on Carillion, it's the money being wasted on the whole project. We're going to get HS2 though now, are we not? Are we now not so far down the road with HS2, that even those who don't like it, such as you, and for that matter me, have to accept, sadly, it's going to happen. The government should always be very careful about the sunk cost fallacy. The fact that you've spent a billion pounds badly does not mean you should go on to spend another £40 billion pounds badly. So it's one of the great errors of government, actually, the sunk cost fallacy, that you carry on with a project even after everyone's realised it's a bad project because it's too embarrassing to say that you've wasted a million pounds. Mm. It is better to have wasted a million pounds than it is to waste 40 million you pounds. You produce a very long list of projects for which the sunk cost fallacy has been applied. A we're, huge we're all list. All the way from Concord on, yeah. arguably. And that, I'm afraid, is all we have time for this week, but I'm very much looking forward to the Modcast in a fortnight's time. Uh, and thank you for well, being in conversation with Conservative Home this morning. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to um, be in conversation with Conservative Home. It's also a great joy to read it every morning. The Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day.